let's move to our main speaker, Professor John Robb, who's a professor of European prehistory uh, at uh, Cambridge. Um, it's a pretty exciting and topical topic that you're going to talk to us about, Professor Robb, which is the Black Death and uh, lessons that might have for our current situation. So do please speak to us. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, let me try sharing my screen. Um, let's see. How does that look? Does everyone have the title slide? Great. Okay, good. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, my talk is a little bit backwards in one sense that over the last few months, there's been a huge flood of people studying ancient epidemics, and they always try to argue that studying ancient epidemics will tell us about COVID and help us deal with modern epidemics. And in fact, I'm actually going about it the other way around. Um, I've started thinking about the Black Death and what COVID teaches us about it, and you'll see why as the talk goes along here. Um, that in some ways, I think COVID is actually very different from the Black Death. And in that sense, I don't think I could apply with a straight face for grant funding to say, let me study medieval times so we can save the world now. But at the same time, hopefully I've learned something about the medieval world. So um, let's talk a little bit about the end of the world. We've made it to 2021, but we may not be out of the woods yet. Should we worry about it? Humans live in a world of catastrophes and crises, but how many of them are really important? This is today's New York Times source of all truth. Um, when we're in the middle of things, every thread that connects the past and the future is vitally important. Every one of these stories tells us about some crisis or other. But probably everyone's had the experience at some point of looking at a newspaper front page from 50 years ago, 100 years ago, even 20 years ago. Deadly little wars about territories that no longer exist assassinations of forgotten people, painstakingly hammered out laws regulating long dead industries, heresies cleansed with fire that are now not even a footnote to history. Why did people worry about them? Were they really important? And yet to the people of the time, some of these presaged the end of the world, at least the end of the world as they knew it. Were they wrong? And did they worry about things that really weren't so important or are our crises going to look so dusty in a couple of decades? How do we know what the really important crises in history are? So I want to talk a little bit today about the nature of crisis. Now, if you want to study the nature of crisis, um, that seems like the end of the world, the Black Death is an obvious candidate. And I must say that in the middle of all the woes that afflict us nowadays, sometimes it's actually been rather comforting to study a catastrophe that killed off half the population of Europe. And you can say, well, we're probably going to make it through whatever we're going through now. Um, the Black Death was an epidemic of bubonic plague, Yersinia pestis. It swept through Eurasia in 1347 through 1350. A virulent bacterial infection, it kills most people who get it painfully within a few days. It killed between a third and half of the population of Europe. It was the kickoff event for the so-called second pandemic, which was a series of recurrent plague epidemics that lasted until the early 18th century. The plague struck Britain in 1348-49 and it killed about 40 to 50% of the people in Britain. That is somewhere between one, 1 million people and 2.5 million people. So quite a lot of deaths. Nobody knew how to make sense of it at the time. Um, doctors thought it might be spread by bad air or miasmas. People, priests said that it was a punishment for humanity's general sinfulness, which is always a pretty sure bet. During the epidemic, as well as fear and grief, there was panic and confusion. Many people seriously thought the world was ending, or at least that the social world was unraveling into anarchy. Now, I'm going to go over the historiography very quickly, and I suspect that some of the things I'll be talking about tonight are moderately heretical among paid up historians, but you can make up your own mind. Um, there's a naive and a, and a sophisticated view. The naive view we might call the pathogen as protagonist model because basically it assumes that you only have to explain how the pathogen arrived in Europe and the rest happens mechanically. 
And the argument here is that once the bacterium arrived in Europe, social transformation of all kinds followed. And the most commonly quoted example of social change is that because peasants moved around more after the epidemic, the plague helped to break the bonds of serfdom and usher in a modern world of free labor working for wages. So that's a simple cause and effect model. There's a more nuanced historical tradition, which goes back 50 or 100 years now, um, which argues that the plague is something ecologically and socially contextualized. So the argument here is that there are always pathogens present. What effect they have depends on their context. For example, whether the population is healthy or biologically compromised. In the most recent view of this is what you might call the perfect storm model. This is the idea that by about 1300, Western Europe was already overpopulated and under a lot of demographic pressure. So any event such as the late medieval climatic downturn could create crises. And the 14th century was generally a century of crises, such as the great famine of 1315 to 20, in which about 10% of England's population died. So the point is the Black Death arrived at a vulnerable and compromised society, and it developed into a perfect storm. It provided a trigger for some changes, and for other changes it accelerated things that were happening anyway. Now, the research project I've been working with after the plague has been trying to determine the actual biological effects of the plague by looking at skeletons. Um, I won't talk much about our results tonight. Um, we've looked at about a thousand skeletons from medieval Cambridge. Um, we found out lots of interesting things. Um, for example, the first evidence of direct evidence of people dying of plague in medieval Cambridge. And here you can see a few sites around Cambridge where our team has extracted Yersinia pestis, pestis pathogen DNA from medieval skeletons, proving that people actually died from the plague here in town. But as I mentioned, I'll talk mainly about other things today. I want to start with a slightly different question. Um, and this is a little bit of a thought experiment. Supposing you were to ask, what was the biggest health problem of the Middle Ages? Now, you can imagine the problems with assessing this directly, but, um, and this is probably why no one has ever actually tried answering this question. What we've tried doing here is to use the official World Health Organization method by which they assess the so-called burden of disease, the human cost of ill health, which is something that's used for health policy planning. Now, this is a very surprisingly simple method. Basically what you do is you count up how many years earlier than a standard lifespan, someone who gets a disease dies, and you add in how many years that a person with the disease suffered with a specified level of disability. And this results in something called disease adjusted life years, which is a proxy for the cost, the human cost of a disease. Now, even for modern populations, this is a notional estimate that involves estimating a lot of parameters. But the good side of it is it does allow comparison between populations and between diseases. So when you try applying this to medieval data, and here our parameters have all been triangulated from lots of different sources, such as medieval skeletal data for some of them, historical data from the 17th and 18th century for others, and modern WHO data. If you try estimating the cost of various diseases, you wind up with something like this graph here. Um, as you can see, the real big killer is infant mortality which killed a lot of people and struck early in life. Um, the next was tuberculosis, which is both very common and which killed and disabled people. And then a, a whole series of bacterial and viral things like measles, smallpox, GI infections, scarlet fever, and so on. Interestingly, the dread forces of famine and war come in very low on the list, well below social inequality and death and childbirth. Now, where did this leave the plague? Well, in terms of causing death and suffering, the plague actually comes out 10th or 12th on the list. Um, it killed a lot of people, especially in the Black Death epidemic. But in the epidemics that followed, it killed many fewer people, usually about 5 to 10% of the population in an epidemic year. And epidemic years only happened about one year in 10 to one year in 20. So a lot of years, there was none at all. Um, in this sense, it was unlike chronic disease like tuberculosis, 
that ground away at the human population and never really went away. In this sense, um, the interesting thing here is to think that different kinds of disasters have different kinds of effects. And the way that I often think about it is that plague epidemics are something like a forest fire. And you'll understand this if you ever walk through a landscape that suffered from a forest fire. It's, a, it's sudden, it's traumatic, it's devastating, and it's highly visible. It looks like hell on earth. But if the basic ecosystem is healthy and adapted to fires, you go back five or 10 years later and it's green again and normal forest succession is underway. Things like tuberculosis are much more like climate change. They're less dramatic, they're less visible, you may never know they're going on, but they're inexorably chewing away at the population all the time. They're less likely to appear like the end of the world, but they're more likely to push us towards it. So in that sense, if you're consulting for the WHO, combined with your TARDIS time travel device, um, what would you actually cure? Plague has always been the poster child for health disasters. But if you really wanted to improve medieval life, the real four horsemen of the apocalypse are a bit less dramatic. Infant death, infectious disease, infectious disease, and infectious disease. That's a bit of a thought experiment to get us started thinking. And now I want to turn a little bit to actual history. <coughs> How does the Black Death rank in the League of Transformative Disasters? Imagine all the possible consequences of major catastrophes. I'm not a comparative disastrologist, but this list covers a lot of them. You can see psychological trauma, cultural trauma, structuring memory in the before the war style, loss of cultural traditions and knowledge, religious renewal, religious um, new religions arising, economic collapse, demographic collapse, health and lifestyle collapse, regime change, internal political restructuring, war, genocide, and so on. Um, so far, COVID has killed about one in a thousand people in the UK and the US. Look at the chaos it's caused. World War II killed three or 4% of the world's population. And who can doubt that it punctuated 20th century history? Given such examples, can you imagine the consequences for our society if some disaster killed one person in two or three, like the Black Death did? And that's really the question that got me started thinking. Um, if COVID is causing as much chaos as it did, what would happen if we actually had a plague like the Black Death? It really would be the end of the world, a total social collapse. The closest historical parallel I could think of would probably be something like the European devastation of Native America. What I want to do now is to go through some of these consequences one by one and just see what the Black Death really did and assess now, this is a little bit unusual as a historical exercise for reasons you'll see later on. Usually historians focus on what the Black Death did, Black Death did rather than what it didn't do. But just tolerate it for a little bit and you'll see what the results look like. Let's begin with psychological and cultural stuff. There's no doubt that the Black Death caused great psychological trauma. Besides normal grief, as a death, it was senseless. It was hard to rationalize. Healthy people died very suddenly in a day or two. Sometimes entire families or communities perished. With death on such a scale, the elaborate religious process of medieval dying was disrupted. It was especially terrifying to die without confession or last rites. What's interesting though, is that there's virtually no plague literature or plague art that might show a culture working through a major trauma. Nowadays, we have Holocaust literature, Vietnam movies, memorials to 9-11, and so on. There's virtually nothing like this for the Black Death. The closest you can get is Boccaccio's Decameron, but that uses the plague as a framing device for lighthearted tales. It's common to ascribe late medieval imagery of mortality to the plague, such as in this triumph of death painting. And this may be true in a general sense, but if so, it merely stepped up an existing genre. All examples of such imagery, such as the doom paintings with the monster eating the humans here, and the three living and three dead motif began well before the plague, or like the dance of death ones here, they first turn up 50 or 100 years after the plague. So the timing is a little bit wonky. 
No cultural traditions were lost, no bodies of knowledge, and the plague does not seem to have been regarded as a historical watershed to structure memory in a sort of before the war style of thought. One way of encapsulating it is a thumbnail example. The 14th century writer in England is Geoffrey Chaucer, who you see here. Chaucer lived through the Black Death in London as a little boy. He had relatives who perished in it. His writing is full of topical and political references, but he never mentions the plague. Like his contemporaries, he's much more interested in things like the Peasants' Revolt. The same is true for religion. There is quite a lot of on-the-fly religious response, sort of coping with the things as they developed, such as pronouncements that the, hate, that the plague was due to human sin and never needed to repent, or rule changes that allowed lay people to give last rites if all the priests had died. There are bursts of popular piety, such as religious guild memberships, endowing charities, and flagellant cults. But all of these forms of piety pre-existed the Black Death, and it's surprising that the Black Death did not generally engender new forms of religious action. Nor did the existential challenge of the plague lead to any major theological discussions, reformulations, new doctrines, or new religions. Economically, you can imagine the chaos caused by almost instantly vanishing up to half the people in the country. One thing that struck contemporary writers a lot was social mobility, which they sometimes saw as anarchy and the end of the social order. So laborers discovered they were in demand and laborers moved around seeking higher wages. And this seemed an overturning of the natural hierarchy of society, at least to the people on top who were writing. Accompanying this, the feudal labor dues workers owned to landowners were increasingly replaced by cash payments, which was a change that had been going on, but was at least accelerated by the plague. A lot of wealthy landowners got poorer as land values fell or the, they were unable to farm all their land. Wages for the poor increased, as you can see in this graph, in spite of attempts to fix wages at a pre plague level by statute. There were increased opportunities for women. Some authors have even blamed the 1381 Peasants' Revolt on an epidemic caused generation of, inter of increasing mobility, prosperity, and a sense of opportunity. Now, when you think about it, these are all straightforward facets of rebalancing the relationship between wealth and land on one hand and people and their labor on the other hand. You have a lot fewer people with the same amount of total wealth and land, and there's a bit of redistribution. But Quite a lot of authors have argued that some of them, such as the erosion of serfhood, were happening anyway, and the epidemic merely accelerated the process. In the landscape, it's very hard to see the differences between pre-plague and post-plague settlements archaeologically. There's really only two changes that stand out. One is rural depopulation. Um, it, as you can see in these maps here, in many, in some areas, villages were deserted, and in many more areas, such as this village in rural Norfolk, they simply shrank. So the graph, the map on the bottom is areas occupied after the plague. The one on the top is areas occupied before the plague. And you can see settlement contracting as there are fewer people. The other big change is the shift in the balance of agriculture. Farming takes a big work for us. If labor becomes scarce, one response is to turn your acres into pasture which is less labor intensive than growing crops. So in later medieval England, this meant mainly keeping sheep for their wool. Keeping larger flocks fueled a huge boom in the wool trade, which was England's single largest industry, the sort of oil trade of its day, and the source, source of both wealth and taxes. You see this if you drive around the countryside around Cambridge, where you have tiny little villages with huge 15th century churches built on the profits of the wool trade. The longest term effect is demographic. Um, obviously, killing this many people suddenly caused a huge demographic crash and the population dropped. But the surprising effect is how long this lasted. There really was no rebound for several centuries. It was only two or 300 years later that populations reached pre-plague levels again. And the explanation for this, <coughs> something proposed by John Hatcher in the history department here, is that Whenever population growth began to take off towards a recovery, 
a smaller epidemic every 10 or 20 years squashed it back down. So it wasn't only the Black Death alone, but the new epidemiological world it ushered in that changed Britain's demographic regime. It's worth mentioning that this kind of demographic change may have occurred anyway. Um, without going too far into counterfactual history, if England was overpopulated with the stressed and vulnerable population, as it entered the late medieval climatic downturn, even without the plague, the population may have dropped either gradually or through repeats of the Great Famine of the early 14th century. Let's turn to political change. Political change is mostly nothing to report. Legal historians have chased, traced some legal changes to the Black Death. It's been argued to have indirectly influenced the Peasants' Revolt a generation later. And elsewhere in Europe, there is anti-Jewish persecution. This isn't that the English like Jews more than other populations, but we couldn't persecute them here because we threw them all out 60 years earlier. But otherwise, the epidemic seems almost entirely uncoupled from politics on any scale. Ignoring a pandemic might cause regime change for Donald I, but it didn't do so for Edward III. When working men began demanding higher wages, contemporary chroniclers thought the social world was overturning, but a few years, it looked much the same. <clears throat> Finally, let's turn to the question of health. Um, these are preliminary res results from our project examining skeletons. Um, you can imagine a whole spectrum of possible changes from a sick and demoralized population doing worse than before to a prosperous, better fed and less dense population doing much better. Our own results are emerging and they're complex, but one thing they seem to show so far is that there's no dramatic flip the switch changes. The change is relatively fine grained and granular and there's much more continuity than change. <clears throat> okay, um, this has been a very quick review of changes due to the Black Death. And let's round it up in a little bit of a summary. As far as I know, I'm the only person who's ever approached the historical consequences of the Black Death by asking what didn't happen rather than what did happen, which probably just proves that archeologists are deviants and normal people become historians. But it's a provocative question. It brings us to one of the great paradoxes of the Black Death. We instinctively feel that something so large and so lethal must have been a huge watershed event that completely changed everything. So why is the Black Death so elusive archeologically? Why did so many of the historical consequences other disasters have had not happen here? In history and culture, why do so few things show an unambiguous before and after distinction rather than arguable gradations or changes of intensity? Why didn't mortality on such an unimaginable scale have much greater effects? And you can see the, <clears throat> you can see the summary of the effects here. Um, politically, very little change, um, surprisingly little change in religion, um, very little change in cultural, very little evidence of cultural trauma, restructuring literature and art, um, some social change, primarily with relations between people and land and their responsibilities for occupying land. Um, very, very sharp psychological trauma, which appears to have been massive, obviously, but faded relatively rapidly. Economic change, immediate chaos, followed by gradual restructuring with lasting change in how people use the landscape and with the lasting rides and wages. And the most significant and long-lasting change was in demography. Let's look now into a little bit into the possible reasons for what's going on here. There are some relatively obvious reasons why the Black Death didn't have some consequences it could have done. So if you think about it, if the Black Death had struck one part of Europe and not another, let's say France had been decimated in England, not or vice versa, you could imagine it shifting an international balance of power or starting wars. But in fact, it struck all areas equally. If it killed the rich, but not the poor, or the poor, but not the rich, it might have shifted internal social relations more. In terms of ideology, medieval Christianity had a lot of hegemony and already provided an elaborate way of dying that by and large disposed of existential questions. It channeled psychological responses into stability, reinforcing rather than undermining institutions. 
knowledge of how to do things was widely distributed rather than diversified and localized, so that even with the massive loss of life, no knowledge bases or traditions were lost. <clears throat> I think one big reason why there wasn't an overall massive economic collapse was the structure of medieval society. If producing a bowl of food requires high-tech machinery, petroleum, electricity, shipping, insurance, banks, chemical factories, supermarkets, and a supply chain of hundreds of people across several continents, your food supply may be very vulnerable. Relatively small perturbations can stop the economy dead. If basic production is low-tech, local, and involves skills almost everyone has, even a much larger disaster won't incapacitate it. To take an analogy, <clears throat> if you remove half the biomass from a ton of elephant, it will die. If you remove half the biomass from a ton of yeast, it simply grows back. The medieval productive economy was basically cellular, centered around the rural village of Manor. Even if decimated, they could pick themselves up, survive, and reproduce the system. So if you think about it, a much lower death rate would cause much more economic chaos in a highly specialized, hyper-integrated, globalized society such as ours. <clears throat> Let's return to some theoretical considerations about the zombie apocalypse. Um, the first one is a very obvious point. What people fear isn't necessarily the result of a careful risk analysis. I used to ask my students why we don't require people to have divorce insurance like we do with motor insurance. When you think about it, divorce is at least as common, costly, and traumatic as serious accidents. People live with things that cause very high levels of death and suffering, such as car accidents, gun crime, heart disease, or in medieval times, tuberculosis, if they can familiarize them, routinize them, or rationalize them. They fear the unknown, things that erupt, erupt unpredictably, dramatically, and incomprehensibility. This is where the four horsemen of the plague and apocalypse and war come from. They fear things that disrupt the world as they know it. Even as we speak, there are people writing letters to the Times or in the 21st century, writing blog posts and tweets about how teaching school children that not everyone is heterosexual or losing a presidential election or being in the European Union or being out of it or any number of other things will bring about the end of civilization as we know it. In the mirror of history, humans are resilient. We've lived through things much bigger than any of these. The emotional politics of the future, the sense of crisis, may be a very poor guide to whether important change is actually going on. It, in some ways, it's like in medicine, where there isn't necessarily a correlation between how much immediate pain something causes and how likely to kill you it is. The point is not to trivialize the Black Death, but just to point out that the human experience of a disaster is different than the historical effects of a disaster. As Stalin is supposed to have said, the death of one person is a tragedy, the death of a million is a statistic. This is useful food for thought as long as you're analyzing the statistic rather than causing it as he did. To understand crises, we need to understand historical processes. Crises are events, and events are linked into ideas about causation. We want to think linearly, as in my top diagram here. Circumstances A caused event B, which caused circumstance consequences C. But at risk of restating the obvious, this isn't really how history works. History is multi-causal. Any event has a lot of different causes. As historians since Brodel in the 1950s have argued, History is multi-scalar, a palimpsest of processes going on at different scales and speeds. So these causes are embedded in both short-term surface histories and deeper histories going back a long time. Moreover, as a general rule of thumb for historians, anything important enough for us to want to explain it will also be a cause of other processes, and anything important enough for us to call it a cause will also be affected by other things. So we can't necessarily pull one factor out and declare it to be the prima mobile, the prime mover. All of this implies that we can, indeed we have to write multiple histories at multiple scales. And in such an approach, causality becomes a narrative way of holding everything else equal so that we can highlight particular relationships 
within a complex web of rationality. So at this point, we might ask, if you take this view of history, which is effectively a process-oriented one rather than an event-oriented one, what is actually special about crises or disasters and catastrophes? Um, what do they do historically that other forms of change don't do? <coughs> Systemically, we can define a crisis as a moment when change happens faster than the system's ability to cope with it without disruption. This often but not always triggers people perceiving it and reacting to it as an altered set of conditions. Do crises have a particular role in historical processes or in fact in evolution? Crises may do different things which gradual processes can't do. And here I just mentioned some of them. A crisis converts quantitative process to a qualitative change from accumulated stress, stresses to the noise of creaking to breakdown. And this may result in qualitatively different outcomes than you might otherwise obtain. So you may end up with new strategies for dealing with your environment rather than ramping up existing ones, whether we're talking about a bridge suddenly collapsing or New Deal legislation for supporting the poor. Crises may act as an evolutionary force that may change internal social structures in specific, perhaps predictable ways. For example, if you generalize on the idea about cellular medieval societies, you may conclude that very specialized forms of production are rigid and brittle, and crises may knock them back to be more generalized components. Crises may make the unthinkable thinkable. The first mandate of any social order is to protect and perpetuate itself. Thus, all proposed policies within a social order have the unspoken rider, if, of course, this doesn't upset the way we do things too much. When you're forced to acknowledge that you're in a different social reality, you may be forced to contemplate doing things differently. There's a war on, we need to get women in the factories. And finally, crises can be productive. A city can get built up in a way that keeps it from growing and renewing until an earthquake, fire, or war levels it and offers a blank canvas for a new century. A social order can get trapped in layers of self-protection that prevent any movement towards change, even when the system is creaking with the effort of trying to stop history. For example, a crisis may allow it to break free and develop in new ways. In many examples of the so-called fall of civilization, and here these are, include a lot of stories that my colleagues in archaeology generate, um, peasants and their productive structures actually continue untouched. What fell when civilization fell were the elite institutions, and the peasants may have been just as well off or better without them. In this sense, in hastening mobility for serfs, the Black Death may have helped to resolve a tension over the nature of how to hold land that had been building up for a long time. Let me wind up with some even more speculative final thoughts about crisis. Um, the conclusion that this leads us to is that crisis is relational, not absolute. The effects of a catastrophe depend obviously on how severe it is and how long it lasts, but they also depend on how people are organized and how people relate to the world around them. With the Black Death, for example, we see how a social world made of cellular units with generalized capabilities is more resilient than one made up of highly specialized integrated units. This leads to an obvious question. Are some ways of organizing our social world more crisis prone than others? I think the answer has to be yes. This is a bit of an involved argument, and it's one that I only got started on coming to the end of writing this paper, but it largely comes down to how you cope with change. The world around us is constantly changing. The masters at dealing with this are hunter-gatherers in the world of other hunter-gatherers. They typically live at low level, levels of population in highly flexible ways. You just map yourself onto whatever new conditions emerge. If rising sea levels drown your territory, you just move somewhere else, end of problem. In contrast, the more demands you place on the world around you, the more you need it to be structured in a particular way, the more you have to fix it at stably at optimum levels, the more change becomes a crisis. Subsistence farmers aren't too badly off as long as they don't live in a desert or in too crowded of landscape that prevents them from moving when they need to. In contrast, modern capitalism positively manufactures crises particularly when combined with rigid political borders. 
The system tends to depend on finding golden a golden moment of maximum productivity and fixing it stably there so that change itself becomes an existential threat. Of course, all of us quitting our jobs and starting to grow potatoes on our allotments is probably not a realistic option, but there may be ways to design societies which are more change friendly. For example, ones that don't specialize to maximize any single objective or fit any single set of conditions rigidly, ones which offer flexibility and multiple organizational possibilities, and ones which conserve cultural and technological diversity as a resource. Let me stop here and finish up. I've ranged pretty widely over the topic, um, including things I know about and things I don't. Um, can summarize it very briefly in four propositions. First, what people experience at the end of the world isn't always the same thing as real historical change. Um, here, for example, nobody would downplay the human tragedy of the Black Death, but its historical effects were much less sweeping and more subtle than we might expect from the sheer scale of mortality alone. Secondly, change and continuity are inextricable. Both we and ancient people notice change in events more than continuity and gradual process, but there tends to be far more of the latter in history than of the former. Third, the historical effects of a catastrophe depend on how big it was and how long it went on, but also on the nature of society. Um, the Black Death didn't result in widespread unemployment and starvation, partly because of the nature of medieval society, a much smaller disruption would have much greater effects in our world today. And fourth, crises as a form of historical time may have special effects distinct from processual change. These include galvanizing people and groups to new actions, pushing social organization in specific directions, and making previously unthinkable possibilities become thinkable and clearing away the past to allow new things to emerge. Ultimately, we don't live in a world of crises. We live in a world of change. In some ways, the end of the world is always happening. Every day sees the end of yesterday's world and the birth of tomorrow's. Maybe we should take thought about how to build societies that do less to conserve yesterday's world and more to welcome change. And then whether or not it becomes a crisis is up to us. Thank you and have a crisis free evening. Well, John, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fantastic when most of us are worrying about whether we dare go to the supermarket uh, to be able to zoom out and say, uh, what's the broader dynamic of these events? And, and interestingly, uh, what might influence the way the world changes after them is both timely and, and fascinating. So thank you very much indeed. Mm. So we're, we're coming into some questions now and I've got some questions coming in on the Q and A. Um, and the first one is from, I'm not sure whether it's feline or feline, uh, maybe it's a French person. Um, what are the key elements of change that made the population growth in the 1600s possible? Increase in medical knowledge, perhaps? Oh, um, let's see. The, it's offering me the option to type answer or answer live, but I assume I can simply just talk and that will work. Is that right? OK. Um, I think. The answer is this is a, a puzzle that no one has entirely solved. And it happens all over Europe at different times. But in general, it's thought to have to do with increased forms of transport and industrialization. And it really takes off from about 1750. I think one of the ideas here is not necessarily medical knowledge, which was pretty limited and advancing, but not widely shared among the hoi polloi for a long time. Um, but for example, if you imagine a more integrated form of transport across Europe, then if there's a food shortfall in one area, people can make it up by shipping in food from elsewhere and so on. Um, that's the best guess, but no one entirely knows. Thank you. Um, I've got a, a question from Mike Bell, who says, great talk. Um, do you think we're overreacting to COVID? Do you think things will be more or less, <laughs> will, will more or less just go back to normal? Um, that's two, that's a two part question. One is, are we overreacting to COVID? And I think the answer is clearly not because, well, I'm not, I'm not a policymaker on this. I don't know how these things work, but, um, 
in some ways, if you don't overreact to something like this early, then you can't catch it before it becomes far more massive than it is, if that makes sense. So in that sense, I think there's an appropriate reaction to it. Um, the question of what goes back to normal is an actually an interesting question. Um, and in some ways, I'm not quite sure what life will be like after COVID. I think it will be mostly the same as before, but I think there will be key differences and new things will emerge. And I'm looking forward to finding out what that is. Um, so you can't ever freeze time and go back to the way it was before. Something is going to be different. In that sense, it's a crisis that is opening up new possibilities. And a, a related question then, John, from um, Camilla Benfield. So what's your prediction about the long lasting socio-political and economic change post COVID? Um, I don't know, that's a good question. I can think of local ones where, um, well, let's take one very trivial example. Um, in our department, we have about 50 discussion groups on particular topics, all of which have been competing for seminar time to hold seminars that traditionally had six people attending them. Um, since COVID, they've all been holding them by Zoom, and suddenly everyone who's interested in late Mesopotamian medical texts from all over Britain tunes in, and you have an entire room full of people. And I don't think they're going to go back on that one. So in that sense, we're learning new ways of doing things. Um, as far as the world shape after COVID, I don't know, but I think there's it may go into a whole category of problems, which you can see as things outgrowing the nation state, problems so big they have to be handled on the world scale. And there's questions of economies crossing borders and how to regulate multinational corporations. There's questions of information flow crossing national borders. There's, and diseases crossing national borders may be another one. And effectively we may be seeing something where there's actually a crisis in world level governance as opposed to national level governance. And this is yet one more thing hammering home that you need some way of, of addressing that problem. So if I go into sort of longer term futurology, that's sort of the direction I would wonder, but anyone here has, has a guess as good as mine. I'm not sure about that, but we hear what you say. Um, uh, can I bring in Philip B? Can I ask you to unmute and ask your question, Philip, please? Yeah, thank you. So John, it's very intriguing uh, lecture, I would say. Uh, and I also have a question that you mentioned, uh, or at least one point that you mentioned in your talk, but it's also related to current situation. Uh, you said that in the after Black Dad, uh, some villages were abandoned, or actually the mm. urbanization was not affected. But I, I, I would actually say that in certain countries, maybe also that's the case in Britain, that we have actually the opposite factor, that people are now moving more to rural, rural areas, because even if you have very high value apartment in the center of London, you would rather be now in Cambridge, I assume. So do you know how the technology, uh, have you actually examined how technology affected uh, this urbanization in that, after that crisis in the Middle Ages uh, and what it might affect uh, after COVID? Thanks. Mm. Well, I think most of Britain remained rural until much, until long after the Black Death. And in that sense, um, people tended to move to cities because it was a way of freeing themselves from the land. And one of the traditional models, models is that medieval cities were unhealthy places and people tended to go there, um, revel in the economic opportunities and then die. And then a fresh generation of suckers would come in from the countryside and replace them. Um, this is one possible model. And we're currently testing it by looking at ways at how much people moved around the medieval countryside. Uh, I think you're right to pinpoint that there is a link between technology and how people urbanize. And in that sense, the modern question of moving out of cities in the face of COVID is clearly related to the fact that you can live in the countryside and be as integrated in many ways um, due to the internet. And again, this is a very recent possibility. I think even until 50 years ago, if you lived in the countryside, you basically were out of the picture as far as a lot of cultural scenes went and a lot of forms of employment. Yeah, I think it's something very comparable to maybe more to Spanish flu than like that. Yeah, in terms yeah. of uh, yeah. thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Philip. Um, I, Mike Bright, uh, with a particularly splendid background, 
Mike, mm. would you uh, like to ask your question, please? You may need to unmute first or we can't hear you. Can you hear yeah. me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, fascinating talk, Professor Rob. Thank you so much. You've given a great perspective, a sweep through the centuries, but you did mention in um, the early part of your talk, 1300 overpopulation, which of course mm. was damaged by the Black Death. Um, if you believe in overpopulation at all, of course, I'd be interested in your comments there. Where would you rate that in the hierarchy of uh, global problems that we see stretching ahead of us? Where would you rate it in the sort of order of things? Oh, um, well, overpopulation is clearly obviously a relation between people and their local environment. And in that sense, overpopulation for England in 1300 meant between four and five million people. And clearly there's a lot less, there's a lot more than that already living only in one region of England these days. And we can do that partly because we can import food from all over the world and partly because agriculture is so much more productive. Um, in that sense, the, <coughs> There are about 8 billion people in the world nowadays. And the question as to whether that's overpopulation or not, um, people have been claiming the human race is going to run out of land to live on for a long time. And somehow we keep managing to find more. I think the real challenge there is going to be the combination of population and climate change. And effectively as areas that are densely populated now become uninhabitable, what do we do? Of course, this will also open up other areas, and it may well be that the high northern latitudes are the great winners from global warming, because there's land, and if you can figure out politically acceptable ways of moving population into them, then it may be a good solution all around. And this is, it's again a case where it may take a crisis to make us start thinking the unthinkable, for instance, that there should be much freer movement of people around the globe. So I'm going to waffle on the question of whether we're all going to die from overpopulation in the future, because I don't know. But I do think there are solutions there. We may need to be forced into them rather than voluntarily coming up with them spontaneously. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mike Bell uh, would like to come in again because he would like to uh, ask you to extend your answer a bit to, to make the point that he, he was keen to know whether you thought we were overreacting psychologically rather than practically. Um, to COVID, I assume you mean? Yes, yes, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I think the... Um, no, I don't think so. I, again, I think we have appropriate reactions. And actually, when you see many of the people primarily in America, but also here as well, you think some people are underreacting to COVID and they should be taking it much more seriously than they are. Um, COVID is actually a little bit of a kind of cognitive challenge for a lot of people, I think, because for many people, it does relatively little. And then for a small percentage of people, it's lethal. It's an all or nothing game. And so it's quite easy for people to brush it off until suddenly it affects their community and they know someone who's been affected very badly. So it's it's hard for us to understand. We need better ways of cognizing it, but I don't think we're we're overreacting to it. No, that's clear. Thank you. And um, I'm getting to the end of the question. So if anybody wants to put their hand up or send in a question, now would be a good time. But can I read Paul Klein's question? He's from Anglia Ruskin University. What do you consider to be the most toxic fear spreading element of the nature of crisis? And he says he realizes it's a jolly awkward question, but he'd like to know your intuitive response, if, even if you haven't got historical data to back it up. Um, that's a really dangerous question because it's almost like an invitation saying, hang out all your personal political prejudices. And um, I'd rather not do that because I'm, I suspect not everyone shares what I think. Um, I think one of the most dangerous aspects is the <clears throat> is the sense that something is going wrong or something is out of control or something is threatening the way that we live now, but we don't know where to localize it. And this makes it makes you easy game for someone who wants to tell you where to localize it and come up with some simple solution. So in that sense, 
crisis can cause fear. And I think a lot of people are afraid of change and don't like to change until they're forced into it. But fear and worry and anxiety can also be a political tool. And this is where you end up with someone saying, the way to solve the problem is to wipe out all people of type X or something like that um, and make up enemies that may not exist. So I think that's one of the real dangers of it. Thank you. Very interesting question. Interesting answer. Thank you. Uh, John Scott has uh, overcome his uh, modesty and well, that was modesty. <laughs> uh, I don't, I, we, we can't really tell. But uh, what I meant was overcome your nervousness of being on the telly and please <laughs> ask your question, John. I have done it once before. So. <laughs> mm. um, fascinating lecture. What One question I did wonder is, does society's understanding of the reasons for the crisis, for instance, people's medical knowledge at the time of the Black Death must have been almost negligible, whereas we all think we know quite a lot about COVID and so on. And presumably that over the centuries people's understanding of a crisis has been varied a lot. Does that make a difference to the response of the society to the crisis? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't know. I think it must do in the sense that um, if, you, if a crisis is accompanied by a sense that things are getting out of control, then if you feel that there are things you can do that can control them, then, um, then that must give you a sense of being able to grapple with it or cope with it better. So in that sense, um, medieval people, I think, really had very little idea where the Black Death was coming from or how to control it. There was some idea about distancing, and they had their own ideas about social distancing. And by the time that they got to the, the end of the second pandemic in Britain, which was its final flourish was the plague of 1665, by then they had a much greater idea about how to control it, and they had it down to a regime where it's a plague year let's close the theaters, let's close the schools, let's send people out of town. And um, they knew that isolation would help it. And to a great extent it did. So in that sense, they, and by then of course, the sense of familiarity and the idea that even if you didn't understand the mechanics of it, there was something you could do that would help you cope with it. Um, I think that was reassuring and it was accompanied by much less panic. Um, in that sense, I think with the COVID, um, there's a lot we don't understand about it, but we know a lot of the basic practical things. Um, we know that isolation is important and distancing, and we know more or less how to kill viruses uh, through things like sanitation processes. So in that sense, a lot of it is in our control. It's mostly controlling our, our co-citizens who don't do that stuff that's the real problem. Does it, does it make a difference uh, in, the, in the sense of the influence of religion? So people presumably in medieval times thought things are the acts of God and so on, and yet we wouldn't look at it that well. And most people wouldn't look at it that way. Does that, is that also part of the knowledge thing? I, I think so, but I, I think um, I'm a little reluctant to say either you have religion or you have knowledge, because I think in many ways um, <laughs> yeah. either they're compatible or... Um, Medieval religion worked very much as our modern medical knowledge does. I don't think it was illogical in, or in some yeah. alternative way. So in that sense, I think that um, what it did do was it let you encompass the thing within a kind of global belief framework so that it wasn't totally irrational. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, can I go to Tessa Kilvington Shaw and read out her question, which is as follows. Um, with the Black Death, if I understood correctly, it affected rich and poor and all members of society. With COVID, it definitely more adversely affects the older and less economically active members of society and also the poor and socially disadvantaged. So will that make a more serious and wider difference in the outcome? Um, that's actually a really interesting question. I think, um, I suspect, although I haven't seen hard figures that the Black Death affected more poor people than rich people, but again, it, it killed both rich and poor. And that was a strong trope in medieval life was that things like disease and fortune affected rich and poor equally. There were leveling mechanisms. I think it, but this is an actual interesting difference between the plagues where the Black Death demonstrably increased the power of poor people or those who survived at least, um, because as Flannery O'Connor said, you can't get poorer than dead. And um, if you survived, your labor was in higher demand. 
and you could command higher wages generally. So in that sense, the play, the Black Death may have actually leveled differences between rich and poor to some extent and allowed more social mobility. Um, I think there's been evidence so far that things like COVID are building into a trend over the last 10 to 20 years of actually increasing inequality in society. And they may work in different ways. Um, if you can work from home and you don't get laid off and you don't risk your life in a public facing position, then you may come out of it as well off or better, it's sort of mildly inconvenienced and putting up with tedium, but basically all right. Um, it may have very differential consequences. So again, it proves that all epidemics are not alike. They may behave very differently. Thank you. Uh, John Cook has his hand up. John, are you, uh, I know you're brave online. Are you going to ask your question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, Valerie, you have to uh, enable my video. Start my video, there we go. Okay, so that was a very interesting talk, uh, John. Thank you very much. You showed um, some data fairly early on on the, um, I can't remember the name of the variable, the loss of life years and, and oh, child mortality yeah. was uh, right at the top and the, the plague was um, some way down. Uh, has that exercise been done for other eras of history? How did that, how has that evolved through the ongoing years? What would it look like today, do you think? Oh, well, the answer is we can tell you very exactly what it looks like today because it's been done um, Basically, this is a method that the World Health Organization and other professionals planning health policy do all the time for, for modern populations. As far as I know, I'm the only person foolhardy enough to try and retrofit it to an ancient society with really bad data, if that makes sense. And yeah. um, I only propose it as a kind of thought experiment. So for modern societies, if you look up the WHO stuff on it, um, what you get is actually quite interesting. The sources of limiting factors that cause us to lose our lives prematurely, as they put it, or to suffer um, years of disabled life tend to be totally different things. And they're all the kind of modern killers like heart disease, cancer, diseases of age, that kind of thing. Um, and you only have to think about the infectious diseases we've managed to control that started out as where they would decimate a continent. And nowadays they're minor, um, sort of minor inconveniences, things like measles. Um, so vaccination programs, there's no question about it. They made a huge difference. Um, smallpox, another example, um, something that's been totally eradicated due to medical science. So in that sense, the, the modern disease adjusted life years are due to almost totally different things. And if you wanna come up with something that's relatively comparable to medieval times, you have to look at the WHO data for developing countries, but even so, that, that doesn't entirely work because there are no countries that are so developing that they don't have antibiotics now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I've got the last couple of written questions now from Neil Adams. Um, apart from the Jewish dynamic, were consequences of Black Death in continental Europe and further east the same as Britain? Um, not entirely. <laughs> in a lot of countries, yes. Um, there was one country in Europe that didn't actually have the Black Death until 1400, which was Iceland. Lucky people that they were. Um, there were arguments that there were areas of Far Eastern Europe, such as, say Russia, where it actually did things like increase the power of um, the control of landlords over serfs. So the it's one of those things where there's a, there's a family resemblance between what happens in a lot of European countries, but it's not identical from country to country. And in that sense, one of the problems is that the best studied place in Europe for it tends to be Britain, well, England specifically. And so um, the tendency is to generalize the English model to other places. Um, Thank you. And, uh... Well, we've got a very nice question to end on, um, and thank you to Ria. She says, thank you for a wonderful talk and insight. She'd like to ask your thoughts uh, that, uh, on the proposition that uh, crises, every crisis brings people together. Hmm. Well, I think that would be very nice if it were true. Um, 
my sense is it can certainly happen. And actually, uh, the the kind of this is actually one of the things that I think can happen in crises is that you get new groups formed that would not otherwise form, and they may have an emergent quality where you, um, for example, I think in a lot of the in a lot of normal time, as you might put it, people get sorted out into social strata and social groups that are moderately rigid, just by routine and habit and assertive mating and things like that, and um, one of the common experiences of crises that upset social order is you get forced into contact with other kinds of people and you may discover this is a good thing. Uh, but I don't know if that's a universal con consequence uh, by any means. I think that you can also imagine that there are good circumstances for xenophobia or for sharpening social barriers and inequality. So I'd like to think it is the way you propose and I certainly hope so in the future. <laughs> John, uh, thank you and thank you, Ria. Let, let's keep our fingers crossed that it does indeed have the uh, potential positive outcome that she implies. Mm. Well, thank you. That's been a stunning uh, evening. Uh, and I think it's allowed us to stand back a bit from the minutiae of day to day survival uh, and think of the bigger picture in a way I think many of us are not equipped to do without the kind of background you've given us. So mm. thank you most warmly uh, on behalf of everybody. Uh, thanks also, uh, of course, to Hugo uh, for a fascinating talk. The idea of those things scuttling around and getting into my grazed hand is really quite astonishing. Mm. Um, it's been a super evening, a very CSAR. I do hope you'll all join us again uh, on the 25th of January when Professor Brandon from Imperial College will talk about hydrogen and its impact on the economy. And I'm sure that will go with a bang, if you'll excuse the expression. Um, thank you all very sure. much and good night. Thank you. Good night.